terrible way of labelling themselves. These are the two classic labels you'll see. I'm no good at maths, or I'm really good at maths. And to these student-attached labels, we have a great way of attaching our own labels onto them. Low ability to high ability. And we do things to reinforce these labels. And classic things, I'm teaching the dumb class, I'm teaching the top class. These labels are very, very strong. Sadly, these labels really feed anxiety into our classrooms. And I think most of us see this at the top level. It's very clear to see that kids who think they're no good at maths have a lot of fear in their class. Now, you may find it surprising um, that even high achieving students also have fears. And most of their fear is about maintaining that status. So here are three ideas for developing growth mindset Okay, so my first idea, and I got this one from Judy very early in my time at uni, a very small suggestion. She actually asked me to change my language. She said, stop talking about low ability classrooms, talk about low achieving classrooms. It was such a small suggestion, but I can't tell you how radical that suggestion is. So what happens when we change the words? He's a low ability student, becomes He's a low achieving student. I've got the lower ability kids. Well, I've actually got the lower achieving kids. This is my favourite. You'll hear this in a faculty all the time. Let's save that activity for the high ability class. If you change those words to, let's save that for the high achieving class, you'll suddenly listen to yourself and wonder what you're doing. Okay, so why does it make a difference? It makes a huge difference. If you describe a student has low ability, you're basically saying the student is the problem. If you say they're low achieving, you're actually saying something isn't working for the kid. There could be a cause, and there might be something we could do about it. Now, I should be very clear, I'm not saying we're, not, we're pretending there is no problem. Some people are worried that changing labels is about political correctness or hiding a problem. We're not hiding a problem, but we're relabeling it, we're reframing the problem. So why does this work? I think it works because it ties into Carol Dweck's ideas on growth mindset and fixed mindset and Andrew Martin's um, model of the link that students make between what they are and how they achieve. Um, so here is a very simple model of what I think goes on in most students' minds. I got great marks in the exam, that means I'm smart. Whereas what we really want to get to is this type of approach. My exam results don't tell me how smart I am. They actually tell me how well I'm working. So, that's my first suggestion. It's a long, slow process. Uh, don't expect to change views of your colleagues. I suggest if you go in there and make this change, keep it to yourself. Just keep it in your own mind. Unfortunately, you will not magically become a superhero teacher. Yeah, you can go in and say, these are just low achievement. You will not be able to suddenly turn the class uh, into able to do calculus. Yeah, it's much harder than that. But you will be transformed. I promise you will be transformed. And the children will notice the difference. They do know what you think. Okay. Here are three magic letters. I, D, K. Uh, most of our kids have taught these letters to us. They know what they mean. And I bring them into my classroom. <laughs> The very first lesson I have with each year group is I say, please use them. When you see something you don't know, write IDK. A little joke I like to say is write IDK, not IDC. It's not I don't care, we do care, but I don't know. Right? And what this does is it means a student takes control of what's going on. You're not judging them, they're just telling you straight out. You're asking something, I don't know how to do it. And of course, it's a very small change then to transform that language I don't know how to do it yet. Okay, this green fellow is what I call the error monster. I also introduce him into my classroom really early. I personify him. And I spend quite a bit of time in class talking about why this guy's actually my good friend. Okay, errors are good. Most students run away from this guy. And what we've got to do is help them actually run towards the error monster. My recommendation is you model it. Many teachers are afraid when they make errors I suggest you do the opposite. Actually laugh at them. 
observe your errors and don't hide them from the class, share them with the class. Talk about how you detect and manage them. Okay, here is a few <coughs> strategies that I've found help in my class. Oh, but before I say that, we can talk about growth <coughs> mindset as much as we like, but the sad fact is what our students, parents and our employers value the most is the final mark. So you've got to be realistic about this. We can talk about growth, but it is ultimately outcomes at the end of stage six that are going to count. So you might think, what can I do with a stage six task? So here is a snapshot of a stage six task. It's pretty brutal, but the student is going to look at that mark on the right hand side, what percentage did I get? This is actually from a very recent task. And one thing I love to do when I get a mark like this is find the 91% inside the 76 and mark it on the paper, write 91%. So this student has actually done a terrific job in this. They have fully mastered the topic. And so I'm going to put that on there and I give them direct feedback on it. And I also give them feedback on how their mark compares to their mark in year 10. And for this student, it is a truly spectacular improvement. So you can modify even some of the assessment tasks that are given to you by your head teacher to do. Use the EAS language, effort, attitude, and strategy. <coughs> so whenever you talk with students about their results, don't just say good or well done. Talk about the specific things. What was their effort like? What was their attitude like? What was their strategy like? It helps you get a more analytical view of it. You can change your own assessments in your class. I work very hard in my class to get away from scores and numbers on assessment, internal assessment tasks. So I go for a feed for a mastery type approach rather than here's a quiz that students have done. Rather than getting a single mark for this, they actually get for each question I ask them. I can ask them to self-assess. I don't assess that for them, I ask them to self-assess. What's your level of mastery for each question? I like to provide scaffolds for growth. And I'll just have to share this one thing, Judy. Here's a <laughs> beautiful picture. I realise later it's a nice differentiated classroom. Here's a picture which I believe summarises what I've learned about teaching. We all know about pre-assessment, about chunking, and about doing internal formative assessment. But I think the things on the left-hand side are critical. I think in order for the right-hand side to work, you have to deal with the things on the left hand side.